The Pentagon has confirmed that North Korea launched a missile that flew over Japan. Now the news comes as South Korean intelligence also suggests that North Korea could be prepping for its sixth nuclear weapons test. Officials say they've seen new activity at its nuclear test site. And North Korean officials have dialed up the rhetoric against the U.S., as it carries out annual war games with South Korea. This represents a major escalation in tensions over North Korea's missile program since all the other launches in recent years have been fired at a high enough angle that they would always come down in the Sea of Japan short of Japanese territory. This time, the Japanese government had to warn civilians living in northern Japan to take shelter and a Japanese government official called it an unprecedented grave threat. The U.S. Missile Defense Agency says the Japanese government alerted the public to take cover in the northern areas of Japan where the North Korean missile flew over, and it says the Japanese military did not attempt to intercept that North Korean missile. The latest provocation from North Korea, reports of a new ballistic missile launch, this one passing over Japanese airspace. ABC's chief international correspondent, Terry Moran, joins me now from London. And Terry, what do we know about this missile and the response in the region? Tom, this is another serious escalation. North Korea firing a missile that crossed over Japanese airspace, something it's done before, but not without warning or at a time of such escalating tension. So the ballistic missile was launched from near Pyongyang and flew east, passing over Japan before landing in the ocean off Hokkaido. Japan's government went on high alert, actually warning people in the north to take cover. It's the latest in a series of provocations from North Korea, which recently tested an intercontinental ballistic missile experts say may be capable of reaching major U.S. cities. North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un has been seen celebrating his recent missile launches, and in response, President Trump has threatened to confront new signs of aggression from North Korea with, quote, fire and fury. This is the 18th missile fired by North Korea since the start of the year and comes just days after President Trump warned North Korea not to do more. This is what he said at a rally on Tuesday. Kim Jong-un, I respect the fact that I believe he is starting to respect us. I respect that fact very much. Respect that fact. And maybe, probably not, but maybe something positive can come about. The timing of the uh, missile uh, being fired tonight uh, coincides with the 10 days of military exercises between uh, U.S. forces and South Korean forces. The North Korean diplomats at the U.N. tonight have complained and called for the U.N. Security Council to, uh, to investigate those exercises. They claim that those are provocative exercises, that they are practice for an invasion. What's also notable about tonight's missile launch is that it comes also just days after Secretary of State Rex Tillerson had suggested that U.N. sanctions had changed Kim Jong-un's behavior. Here's what he said. I think it is worth noting that we have had no missile launches or provocative acts on the part of North Korea since the unanimous adoption of the U.N. Security Council resolution. And I want to take note of that. I want to acknowledge it. I'm, I uh, am pleased to see that the regime in Pyongyang has, has certainly demonstrated some level of restraint that we've not seen in the past. Looks like the tensions are escalating there. We've got former Air Force Assistant Vice Chief of Staff. He's retired Lieutenant General Thomas McInerney joins me now. General, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I'm very disturbed by it, Liz, as, as you would uh, realize, because uh, we don't have the specific details. I've heard anything from it flew over and then broke up, or it uh, uh, landed in the waters nearby. We haven't gotten confirmation out of PACCOM, Pacific Command, or out of the Pentagon. But I think you're showing some uh, good information. Now, I think it's probably a B-roll and is not the actual picture. So. We want to make sure our viewers understand that. 
Well, it's but set, it is very worrisome. Yeah, Japan, Japanese authorities set off an emergency alert system as a precaution as the missile headed toward the country. Again, North Korea firing a missile that flew over Japan and landed in the sea. Uh, what is this going to do with the tensions there now? Well, I think it's going to increase them. And it's clearly pushing Japan towards uh, some self-defense or deterrent capability, and it should. They have nothing to respond, Liz. So they're going to have to make a decision. Are they going to build a response capability to any threat from North Korea? And it's going to drive toward it. It won't happen overnight because the Japanese are very care careful at what they do. But I think you're going to see more and more pressure for the Japanese government to be forced to uh, <clears throat> deploy a weapon system that they can use to respond. But it's definitely something that will infuriate the president, and rightly so. And it's something that will, I think, cause the United States to really push China a lot harder than they even have been, which has sort of been to the max lately um, in terms of hedging against North yeah. Korea. And a lot of people have been describing this dynamic between President Trump and really previous U.S. presidents as well and Kim Jong-un in that regime. It's kind of a game of chicken is something that I've heard floated. But we know this is not a game. Right. We know that these are, are potentially millions of lives at stake, as you're saying. And, and if this development is even anywhere near true, those stakes just got higher today. Mm -hmm. uh, you're absolutely right. It's not a game. Um, it's not a game of chicken. There are real consequences here. Millions of lives when you calculate out North and South Korea, Japan, whoever else is in arm's length of the missile. Um, or a nuclear missile. This wasn't any old launch, though. The missile flew directly over Japan, a significant escalation showing North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's defiance of President Trump and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Trump had said Kim was starting to respect the U.S., but he may have to rethink that assessment following what happened this morning. Now, South Korea Joint Chiefs of Staff says the missile was fired from Sunan uh, near Pyongyang at 5 uh, 57 a.m. South Korea time. Uh, the JCS says the missile flew directly over the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido and fell into the North Pacific Ocean. The Pentagon also uh, confirmed the missile uh, that it flew over Japan's territory, adding that it's still assessing uh, the launch. Uh, the missile flew some 2,700 kilometers, reaching an altitude of 550 kilometers. Now, experts say the North probably fired the missile to demonstrate that it's capable of targeting the U.S. territory of Guam at any given moment. The distance between Pyongyang and Guam is some 3,000 kilometers away. At the height of U.S.-North Korea tensions earlier this month, uh, North Korea threatened to launch four intermediate ballistic missiles into waters near Guam to show it was capable of targeting U.S. military bases on the island. Now, Japan, which sounded sirens in certain regions upon news of the launch, is deeply concerned by the escalation, but made no effort to shoot down the missile. Now, Japan's Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshida Suga uh, described it as an unprecedented grave threat, and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe vowed to protect the Japanese public in the wake of this provocation. Now, this comes after the North launched three short-range ballistic missiles into the East Sea over the weekend. Uh, what's notable about the timing of this, and I've spoken to senior U.S. officials who said that they had seen some sort of movement uh, that suggested that the North Koreans were preparing for an intermediate-range ballistic missile, uh, but they weren't sure whether that was going to come. They were surprised that, ha that it came today. Uh, remember, there are 10 days of military exercises taking place right now in South Korea between the U.S. military and the South Korean military. Uh, those exercises are uh, slated to end on Wednesday. Uh, those exercises have our annual exercise. They have angered uh, Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. And what's notable is just last week, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson had praised the North Korean leader, saying that, in fact, uh, he had shown a great deal of restraint. Uh, but then you saw over the weekend he fired three missiles. Two of them were short range. Um, one of them failed of the three. Uh, so I believe that this is time to coincide with those military exercises with South Korea. Back to you. Jennifer, do we know how or even when we can expect to hear from the White House on this? Well, I know that the White House has called over here to the Pentagon to get the latest intelligence on this. Uh, right now, U.S. Pacific Command uh, and others are trying to gather the data on this missile launch, and, and so they will be communicating that to the White House. Um, the White House will want to wait, of course, until they have that information, uh, because there will be a lot of decisions uh, based on this. 
So strong words coming out of Seoul and also a chorus of condemnation has been streaming in from across the world, as you'd imagine, following North Korea's latest missile provocation. Tokyo, in particular, is incensed after it was prompted to warn its local residents to take shelter as the North Korea missile threw, uh, flew rather, over its territory. This kind of range missile could pose a threat to Guam, and it is not clear whether this is the last of the missiles being fired uh, from Pyongyang, uh, especially since these military exercises are ongoing. Jennifer, from your time covering North Korea and from your perspective, are we in a different place with North Korea than we previously have been? It certainly feels like it is uh, that tension is ratcheting up. There's a what feels like a very dangerous game of chicken, a, almost a uh, dare uh, uh, taking place. And Kim Jong Un continues to try to show that he is still uh, still in power and in control and able to fire these missiles. But certainly the range of these missiles has gotten the attention uh, and the capabilities in the last six months of what we've seen has gotten the attention of, of those who watch these things here at the Pentagon and elsewhere. Jennifer, just a quick final question. Uh, you talk about Secretary of State Tillerson and, and what sounds like very diplomatic uh, tone he took last week. Can you give any anticipation about what that diplomacy will look like moving forward? Well, I think that you're going to see a very tough line from not only the White House. Uh, Tillerson had praised those U.N. sanctions. Uh, the Security Council had imposed uh, unanimously sanctions against North Korea, and that was significant. That, that was an achievement, but it is clear that it is not deterring um, Kim Jong-un. So now they're going to have to go back to the drawing board on this. A South Korean presidential adviser criticized Donald Trump's escalating North Korea threats, exposing a potential rift with a key ally in the firing line if war breaks out. Moon Chung-in, a special adviser to South Korean President Moon Jae-in, told ABC News that Trump's vow to unleash fire and fury if the isolated nation continued its provocations was very worrisome. That comment from Trump came less than 24 hours after a telephone conversation in which Moon Jae-in urged him to tone things down, Moon Chung-in said. This is very unusual. We do not expect that the President of the United States would make that kind of statement, Moon Chung-in said, according to ABC News. It is very worrisome for the President of the United States to fill, fuel, the crisis. The comments represent the most pointed criticism from a U.S. ally in Asia since Trump launched his new push to pressure Kim Jong-un and his benefactors in Beijing. They underscore Trump's risk of sowing division with nations that depend on the U.S. for protection against North Korea and would be vital to the success of a military campaign. Since taking office, Moon Jae-in's administration has sought to open a dialogue with North Korea, even while strengthening its defenses in response to Kim's recent tests of intercontinental ballistic missiles. The criticism from a presidential adviser comes as the U.S.'s top general Joseph Dunford prepares to meet with Moon Jae-in in Seoul on a previously scheduled visit. The chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff will also meet with senior military officials. The U.S. has almost 30,000 military personnel stationed in South Korea and has assured the country's security since the Korean War ended without a peace treaty almost six decades ago. Dunford will next head to China, Yonhap News Agency reported, citing an unidentified military official in a weekend call with Trump. Chinese President Xi Jinping called for all sides to maintain restraint and avoid inflammatory comments. Moon Chung-in, South Korea's ambassador at large for international security, criticized the Trump administration for what he said was a lack of clarity over North Korea. It is a chicken game, but I think what is needed right now is mutual restraint, 
Moon Chung in told ABC News. The advisor visited the U.S. in June and attended leaders' summits in North Korea in 2002-2007. An honorary professor at Yonsei University in Seoul, Moon Chung in has previously backed concessions to Pyongyang such as scaling back U.S. South Korean military exercises if North Korea suspends nuclear and missile activities, according to local media. South Korea's presidential office said his remark on military drills did not represent an official government position, and officials said they also warned the professor that such comments are not conducive to good relations with the U.S. Yon Hap reported in June. Analysts have warned of the potential for further escalation in the coming days as both North and South Korea on Tuesday celebrate the anniversary of the end of Japanese occupation in 1945. Meanwhile, South Korea is planning to participate in massive joint military exercises with the U.S. starting August 21. Trump said last week that Kim had gotten away with provocations for too long and suggested that he was ready to hit the reclusive regime with U.S. military might. He capped a week of escalating rhetoric with another warning on Friday, that if Kim made any overt threat or strike at a U.S. territory or ally that he will truly regret it, and he will regret it fast. While the Australian and Japanese governments have backed Trump's hardline against North Korea, the comments have raised concerns that the U.S. might be willing to accept collateral damage among its Asian allies to protect the American homeland. Dunford said last month that it was unimaginable to allow North Korea to develop the capability to strike a U.S. city with a nuclear weapon. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, a Republican, told NBC News that Trump told him that if thousands die, they're going to die over there. A South Korean presidential adviser criticized Donald Trump's escalating North Korea threats, exposing a potential rift with a key ally in the firing line if war breaks out. Moon Chung-in, a special adviser to South Korean President Moon Jae-in, told ABC News that Trump's vow to unleash fire and fury if the isolated nation continued its provocations was very worrisome. That comment from Trump came less than 24 hours after a telephone conversation in which Moon Jae-in urged him to tone things down, Moon Chung-in said. This is very unusual, we do not expect that the President of the United States would make that kind of statement, Moon Chung-in said, according to ABC News. It is very worrisome for the President of the United States to fill, fuel, the crisis. The comments represent the most pointed criticism from a U.S. ally in Asia since Trump launched his new push to pressure Kim Jong-un and his benefactors in Beijing. They underscore Trump's risk of sowing division with nations that depend on the U.S. for protection against North Korea and would be vital to the success of a military campaign. Since taking office, Moon Jae-in's administration has sought to open a dialogue with North Korea, even while strengthening its defenses in response to Kim's recent tests of intercontinental ballistic missiles. The criticism from a presidential adviser comes as the U.S.'s top general Joseph Dunford prepares to meet with Moon Jae-in in Seoul on a previously scheduled visit. The chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff will also meet with senior military officials. The U.S. has almost 30,000 military personnel stationed in South Korea and has assured the country's security since the Korean War ended without a peace treaty almost six decades ago. Dunford will next head to China, Yonhap News Agency reported, citing an unidentified military official in a weekend call with Trump. Chinese President Xi Jinping called for all sides to maintain restraint and avoid inflammatory comments. Moon Chung-in, South Korea's ambassador at large for international security, criticized the Trump administration for what he said was a lack of clarity over North Korea. It is a chicken game, but I think what is needed right now is mutual restraint, 
Moon Chung in told ABC News. The advisor visited the U.S. in June and attended leaders' summits in North Korea in 2002-2007. An honorary professor at Yonsei University in Seoul, Moon Chung in has previously backed concessions to Pyongyang such as scaling back U.S. South Korean military exercises if North Korea suspends nuclear and missile activities, according to local media. South Korea's presidential office said his remark on military drills did not represent an official government position, and officials said they also warned the professor that such comments are not conducive to good relations with the U.S. Yonhap reported in June. Analysts have warned of the potential for further escalation in the coming days as both North and South Korea on Tuesday celebrate the anniversary of the end of Japanese occupation in 1945. Meanwhile, South Korea is planning to participate in massive joint military exercises with the U.S. starting August 21. Trump said last week that Kim had gotten away with provocations for too long and suggested that he was ready to hit the reclusive regime with U.S. military might. He capped a week of escalating rhetoric with another warning on Friday, that if Kim made any overt threat or strike at a U.S. territory or ally that he will truly regret it, and he will regret it fast. While the Australian and Japanese governments have backed Trump's hardline against North Korea, the comments have raised concerns that the U.S. might be willing to accept collateral damage among its Asian allies to protect the American homeland. Dunford said last month that it was unimaginable to allow North Korea to develop the capability to strike a U.S. city with a nuclear weapon. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, a Republican, told NBC News that Trump told him that if thousands die, they're going to die over there. A South Korean presidential adviser criticized Donald Trump's escalating North Korea threats, exposing a potential rift with a key ally in the firing line if war breaks out. Moon Chung-in, a special adviser to South Korean President Moon Jae-in, told ABC News that Trump's vow to unleash fire and fury if the isolated nation continued its provocations was very worrisome. That comment from Trump came less than 24 hours after a telephone conversation in which Moon Jae-in urged him to tone things down, Moon Chung-in said. This is very unusual, we do not expect that the President of the United States would make that kind of statement, Moon Chung-in said, according to ABC News. It is very worrisome for the President of the United States to fill, fuel, the crisis. The comments represent the most pointed criticism from a U.S. ally in Asia since Trump launched his new push to pressure Kim Jong-un and his benefactors in Beijing. They underscore Trump's risk of sowing division with nations that depend on the U.S. for protection against North Korea and would be vital to the success of a military campaign. Since taking office, Moon Jae-in's administration has sought to open a dialogue with North Korea, even while strengthening its defenses in response to Kim's recent tests of intercontinental ballistic missiles. The criticism from a presidential adviser comes as the U.S.'s top general Joseph Dunford prepares to meet with Moon Jae-in in Seoul on a previously scheduled visit. The chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff will also meet with senior military officials. The U.S. has almost 30,000 military personnel stationed in South Korea and has assured the country's security since the Korean War ended without a peace treaty almost six decades ago. Dunford will next head to China, Yonhap News Agency reported, citing an unidentified military official in a weekend call with Trump. Chinese President Xi Jinping called for all sides to maintain restraint and avoid inflammatory comments. Moon Chung-in, South Korea's ambassador at large for international security, criticized the Trump administration for what he said was a lack of clarity over North Korea. It is a chicken game, but I think what is needed right now is mutual restraint, 
Moon Chung in told ABC News. The advisor visited the U.S. in June and attended leaders' summits in North Korea in 2000 and 2007. An honorary professor at Yonsei University in Seoul, Moon Chung in has previously backed concessions to Pyongyang, such as scaling back U.S. South Korean military exercises if North Korea suspends nuclear and missile activities, according to local media. South Korea's presidential office said his remark on military drills did not represent an official government position, and officials said they also warned the professor that such comments are not conducive to good relations with the U.S., Yonhap reported in June. Analysts have warned of the potential for further escalation in the coming days as both North and South Korea on Tuesday celebrate the anniversary of the end of Japanese occupation in 1945. Meanwhile, South Korea is planning to participate in massive joint military exercises with the U.S. starting August 21. Trump said last week that Kim had gotten away with provocations for too long and suggested that he was ready to hit the reclusive regime with U.S. military might. He capped a week of escalating rhetoric with another warning on Friday, that if Kim made any overt threat or strike at a U.S. territory or ally that he will truly regret it, and he will regret it fast. While the Australian and Japanese governments have backed Trump's hardline against North Korea, the comments have raised concerns that the U.S. might be willing to accept collateral damage among its Asian allies to protect the American homeland. Dunford said last month that it was unimaginable to allow North Korea to develop the capability to strike a U.S. city with a nuclear weapon. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, a Republican, told NBC News that Trump told him that if thousands die, they're going to die over there.